So I want people to understand, I want them to think. We live in a society where, where we're bombarded with commercials, big pharma, you know, so they give you all the warning on Opdivo, the immune therapy that's a new chance for new life. And when you look at the little picture at the bottom, it says they live 12 months versus the nine months of the control. The control, these experiments aren't done. The vaccines don't have to be made or regulated like drugs. They're, they're biologics, they're given a free pass. There's a vaccine court. You can't sue the doctor, you can't sue the manufacturer. There's a federal court that oversees vaccine injury and it's more corrupt than anything you could ever imagine, ever imagine. And, and so they, they do everything they can to keep the public from knowing that every single shot damages you and, and you might not see the cancer for two decades. And that, that's the very first thing. If we lived a biblical life, but, but also a biblical life is render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. That's, that's money. They could have all my money. They don't have any right to do anything to my body. They don't have any right to inject anything I don't want injected into my body. So to live a healthy life, prevent anyone from forcing you to take toxic drugs, for, you know, and, and it's mind control. I was the same way, I was brainwashed. How, how are we brainwashed in, in our society? We all have the TV on, uh, interestingly, in this whole XMRV thing. Uh, my mom was watching Good Morning America um, one day back in Frederick, Maryland, and I'm in California. Uh, this is probably 2010 or so, or 11, when, uh, when, every, when, the, when the press shut everything down. And she says, Judy, it just went around the ticker tape at the bottom of the screen that you, you know, XMRV is proven false. You can all go home. It was a lab contaminant. Um, well, it may well be have been a lab contaminant, but it's in humans and it's been there quite a while. So um, we need to turn off these TVs. We need to. We need to. The media is is 95 percent. You know, a big pharma owns the media. Our politicians. We need to dig deeper. We need to look in the truth. We need to start reading books again. Scientists don't ask questions. All I did wrong, my only, que my only crime, was I asked too many questions. Really? In, in the United States of America, we're censored. Everything's censored. So to look at things like natural news, to come to meetings like the truth about cancer. I was just floored today because, you know, today was the first time I was treated like a human being who had knowledge. Wonderful to be here today. My name is uh, Judy A. Mikovits. Um, I'm a PhD biochemist and molecular biologist, have done cancer research largely at the National Cancer Institute in Frederick, Maryland um, since 1980. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I've always I, re I started working as a natural products chemist and a protein chemist in, uh, in, pro in fermentation chemistry. And my, my job was to make the first interferon alpha, the first immune therapy that actually went into people to cure cancer when we discovered how powerful interferons were for the magic bullet against cancer. So the Time Magazine in March 31st, 1980, when I was a senior in college at University of Virginia, was um, the big if, and there was a droplet, and it was the mat, it was interferon, and I said, that's what I'm going to do. So we first started working with the first human retroviruses. Those are retroviruses like HIV. So we were among the first people to begin recognizing that when the young men were getting sick with all of these opportunistic infections, this it used to be called gay man's gay related immune deficiency grid. And um, we isolated the viruses, the virus, HIV, um, that um, and pr pretty well changed the world with our research. My PhD thesis um, was actually shifted the paradigm. So at the time we thought that a type of T-cell was the, was the problem in the disease. And that was the T-cell that was being killed, but it wasn't being killed by the virus. It was being killed by indirect mechanisms. We used to call it bystander effects because so um, my PhD thesis in fact was uh, defended um, a week after Magic Johnson declared he was HIV positive. That was November 14, 1991. In 2009, 
we were working on autism and a disease called myalgic encephalomyelitis and um, many of the families with the patients had um, different kinds of cancers and there was a little cluster of lymphoma and, and leukemias in, in Klein Village, a cluster of, of ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, um, uh, a motor neuron disease, and um, this, this chronic fatigue syndrome. And it looked like a virus, it smelled like a virus, a retrovirus, um, because those are the kinds of viruses that disrupt the immune system and several other investigators back in the 90s had actually isolated retroviruses from these people but the government called them contaminants that they weren't real and that they didn't have anything to do with the disease well we isolated a new family of viruses that were called xenotropic murine leukemia virus related virus so these viruses were murine leukemia viruses mouse viruses so these viruses were murine leukemia viruses, mouse viruses. And what the, so spin forward two years, uh, our paper published in one of the best scientific journals in the world in science, October 8, 2009. Um, usually that makes one's career. Um, in my case, it ended my life as a scientist as I knew it. Uh, and. Uh, uh, basically the realization, the big oh my god of all of those sequences we've seen and all of those proteins and all of these contaminants are causing disease. The fact that they were real um, was just too much for 25 million Americans are infected with the viruses that came out of the lab from out of labs into humans via contaminated blood and vaccines. And that was what so I was fired, jailed, um, without cause, without hearing, without any civil rights at all, just to just drug out of my house in shackles one day, November 18, 2011. Um, I refused to denounce the data. I refused to say it was a mistake. We had the data, I showed the data, I showed all of the data, and I, I just refused. They basically said, tell everybody you made it all up and you can go home. And if you don't, we'll destroy you. And they did. <laughs> I mean, economically as a profession, but they didn't be because thank God for, for my faith and for my husband and for my family and for the patients. Because they never, they, you know, uh, in order to steal one's passion, my passion wasn't money. Scientists don't make money. My passion was helping people and the patients never walked away from me. The most likely way that these murine leukemia virus related viruses, these, these types of viruses entered humans was through vaccines. So when did we start vaccines? 1953, 1934, right, right in the 30s with the, with the polio and what we were doing to attenuate to make the virus less um, pathogenic, less toxic, is we were passing them through mouse brains. So we were passing them through the brains of mice and, and every scientist who works with these viruses and worked at the National Cancer Institute recognized the possibility that if you put human tissue and mouse tissue together, the possibility is that you're going to pick up a virus that is silent in the mouse. That is, it doesn't hurt the mouse, um, but it kills the human or causes serious disease in the human.